discipleship. Is it easy to be a follower of Jesus? What happened to the original 12? Did they become rich? Did they become famous? Yes, they did become famous, right? <laughs> yeah. But they all died. Yeah. And they all suffered for following the Lord Jesus Christ. That is discipleship. And discipleship, we told you, is transformation. Then we ask the question, okay, how long have you been here? What has happened to your life? If I ask you, what, was, uh, what, what, what are you like, like five years ago? Are you the same person? If you say, well, yeah, kind of the same. I'm like, seriously, maybe we should, we should do the sinner's prayer again, right? It should be transforming. It should be transforming into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Again, look at your seatmates. Do, do you see Jesus Christ in them? Yeah. <laughs> you should. You should be seeing Christ. Okay? I don't expect you to look like Jesus Christ, and nobody knows how Jesus Christ looks like anyway, right? And we're not expected to be clones of Jesus Christ. But we need to follow the steps of Jesus. Try our best through the work of the Holy Spirit to be transformed. And then, of course, ministry. Last week was very hard because what is ministry about? Ministry about service, right? Ministry about serving one another in Christ. I'm going to cry. <laughs> yeah. um, next slide, please. Yes, ministry about, is about strengthening one another, strengthening, edifying one another, serving one another. I told you the only reason why you're here is because you want to serve. That's not it, because it's rooted in worship. It begins with worship, and then it comes with ministry. So it's serving others. And we said that ministry is just an overflow of God's love in you. So what is the antidote for burnout in ministry? Again, Jesus Christ, the cross. Cling to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be okay. You will be fine. I hope that the ministry leaders here, after last week's talk, have actually thought about the way you're doing ministry. I said ministry is not about you building your own tiny kingdoms at Central Baptist Church, right? Is it about that? Because if it's about that, then boom, you may go. You know, that's not the way it is. It is about Jesus Christ. And as brothers and sisters in Christ connected to one another, you cannot do your ministry on your own. You have to be connected with other ministries. You have to be connected with the vision and the leadership of this church. That is what it's all about. Okay, this is just the intro. And today, it's all about missions. Okay, can we say the word together? One, two, three, go. Missions. What's your idea of missions? Come on. Some words from the, from the congregation. Anyone? Evangelism? Yeah. The Great Commission? Going out to the world? Very good. Yeah. Mission, right? So we have this idea of mission. And I would like to qualify myself here because I'm going to present to you a different kind of mission, right? A different a different view of what mission is all about. I am a missionary from the Philippines. Okay, I believe that my first calling is to be a missionary. I'm a medical doctor, and like any of those people that we have been praying for, can we not do the testing now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like any of those people, okay, in the world out there, remember every week we pray for Angela. We pray for a missionary every week. I've gone through the rigors of support raising, asking people for money so that I can go for missions, right? I, I have gone through that. So what I would like to tell you here is that before I present to you a different perspective of missions based on our context here at Central Baptist Church, I would like you to understand that I don't have anything against missions because I am a missionary. And I have gone through cross-cultural mission. Actually, my original target group of people to do missions is actually Indonesia. You know, I was praying for God to send me to Indonesia. Why am I in Australia? I don't really know, right? But it has been Indonesia, and I've tried to learn the language. I did my missions exposure there. I kind of blended in to the people there. Is, are there any Indonesians here um, in the congregation? There you go. Yeah, apakabar? Yeah, 
bike? <laughs> That's the only thing that I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you get that? Um, I've been praying for that, but God has a different way of, of calling me. So I don't have anything against missions, and missions is good. It's cross-cultural missions, going into different frontiers to reach out to people. And I will show you, instead of me writing prayer letters, you know, with the advent of email and PowerPoint and everything during that time, early stage of Microsoft, <laughs> Right. Um, I do my, my, my email prayer letters through PowerPoint, but it's low res because the, 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 the CPUs during that time, you know, when, when I send them the PowerPoint, it's like really, really slow. But then I try to make it fast, right? I'm going to show it to you. This is a sampler. The PowerPoint show is there. The PowerPoint show in the file that says John MD update is there. And, and this is it. Okay. So this is my prayer letter. This is John MD update, special edition. This is my final year in the seminary. I have 15 credit units to finish from Asian Theological Seminary. It's like, I'm expected to graduate from the seminary. I have 15 unit credit, but these are some of the things that I am doing at the moment. So I'm doing medical missions. So that's me. There's a doctor there. Um, sorry, low res, yeah, because, and then I do medical consultancy. I do youth leadership training. All of these things happening. This is the crazy life of Dr. John Luster, you know? And then aside from that, as an artist, I'm doing this. I'm doing choreography. I'm doing performances. I'm doing an actor. My name is right. Ta, 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 ta. And then I'm organizing this crazy mission trip, you know? So this is like a support letter telling everyone, okay, this April, I'm organizing a mission trip to Vera Catanduanas. This is like an island in the Philippines. Lead a team of 26 college students and young professionals are going to do creative arts, medical missions, evangelists. There you go. And then the prayer part wherein you would need to ask for money, right? So prayer items, I don't directly ask for money. I just tell them, you know what? Please pray for this. Please pray for the Lord. Pro pro provide us direction. Provide us with the money. And is there any more? There. there. Uh, and please provide wisdom and direction for me as I graduate from the seminary. Crazy, crazy life of Dr. John. Do I get burned out? No, I'm still young, not married. I can do all things through Christ. It gives me strength. So I am a missionary. I just like to qualify that. Nothing against missions. Nothing, you know, like I have a heart um, for missions. But today, we're going to talk about missions and our context for mission. So mission for some is evangelism. That's what my wife says, right? And during my time, there was this big debate about what missions is and what evangelism is. They say, well, if you, share, um, if you share the gospel to local people, that's evangelism. If you share the gospel to cross-cultural people from overseas, that's mission. The same, you know, but people like try to knock their heads off about what missions and evangelism is all about. The next jargon for this time is like, is it about missions or is it about disciple making? Because based on Matthew 28, 18 to 20, can you read it actually? It's a little bit small. But then it said, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore, and go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the teaching them to obey everything He commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. It's easy to tell people about Jesus. Oh, now wake up, right? You, you woke up already. It's easy to tell people God loves you, but it's difficult to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? That's why for those who are like um, asking me, what happened to some of our evangelistic efforts here at Central Baptist Church? Ever since you came here, you cut down the street cafe, you cut down the Friday night service, we're distributing tracts, we're giving people the good news. But my question is, how do you disciple those people you meet in the streets? Do you have the infrastructure and the capacity to take care of each and every one of them? No. And then they will say, well, it's not our problem. Someone will disciple them eventually. No. You're doing them a great disservice by doing that. The commandment of Jesus is for us to, to make disciples. And I told you last week, discipleship is not some seminar. It's not like a platform or program. It's sharing life with the individual, making sure that they are transformed in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe get empowered in ministry, serve in music, serve in the ushering all of that, and get involved in the life of the church. That is what the mission is all about. Now, the thing is, our church is in the city, right? Right? And the thing is, like, should we go elsewhere? You know, like, I mean, our missionaries are doing that. And that's the battle during the 80s because they feel like, well, churches have become so inward-looking, they have forgotten the rest of the world. 
But in the year 2000s, there was the rise of the megacities, the rise of the global cities. And you know what? You don't need to go to Africa to meet an African. You don't need to go to China to meet a genuine Chinese. You know, I'm not talking about people who have been born. Because everyone is where? Everyone is in the same city. And that is what we're going to talk about. There is that urgency for us to go. To go into the world and to make disciples. But for us, the world is here. It is already here. It is already there at our doorstep. And so what is our task? Our task is to bring them in. To bring them in, not just to do a lip service that, okay, Jesus loves you, bye. Okay, this is the track. Jesus loves There was one time I was in town hall, and there was this at the corner of that massive traffic light there. There, were like, there, was, there was a group of people there like with massive signs, you know, Jesus loves you. And then Jesus hates the fags, and Jesus hates the lesbians, and Jesus hates this. And I'm like, seriously, you're making a mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ by doing that. The evangelism is not like that anymore. It's not like that anymore. Evangelism is connecting. Evangelism is reaching out and making people feel the love of God. We are made for missions, and my verse for this morning is Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, wonderfully read by William this morning. It's about the local church. It's about the local church. Are you familiar with, the, with this verse in Acts? What is the context? Okay, can we read this together? One, two, three. A lot of, a lot of difficult words. Let's, let's, let's give it a go. It will awaken you anyway. One, two, three, go. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews. Stop. Not Christians, okay? Not Christians. Jews. And even if they're Jews, you consider them as not Christians, unbelievers, okay? God-fearing Jews. Continue. From every nation under heaven, Parthians, Medes, and the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arab, Jerusalem, an ancient global city. Do you, do you see that? And it's so much the same as where we are right now. Can we have the Sydney video? And let us see where we are right now in this church. Where are we placed um, here? So this is a picture of an ancient global city. And let's see what Sydney is all about. Okay. Courtesy of Channel News. Ah, uh, Channel News. Have Seven. a strong opinion of Sydney, but that might change in the next few minutes. Our city is anything but average. We're the nation's youngest capital. Women outnumber men. We're also the most devout, the most diverse, and so much more. So here's the real and very surprising Sydney. <laughs> Sydney, the place we call home, Australia's economic powerhouse. We're adding almost 90,000 people to our city every single year. We've been growing like topsy. The fastest growing city in the country. Back 50 years ago, Sydney had just hit 2 million people. And we're going to finish next year at 5 million people. The changing face of Sydney has been phenomenal. I didn't grow up here in Sydney. My hometown was Tamworth. But when I first moved here almost 25 years ago, like most newcomers, I thought this place was amazing. In its heart, there is scarcely a street without some building activity. New tall buildings. Tear into it, knock it down and build something new and bigger. That was then. This is now. So what will be our future? Mark McCrindle is Australia's leading demographer. He loves statistics almost as much as this city. And what he's found is a fascinating and complex landscape 
where old ways and old attitudes are disappearing. We used to have this, this almost cringe of, oh, you know, uh, this part of the city is better than that part of the city, and people would be perhaps embarrassed if they weren't you know, closer to where the action was. That's all changed. Uh, people in Greater Western Sydney embrace that as their moniker, proud of being a Western. Migration is also changing Sydney as the city's newest citizens form new tribes in its older suburbs. South Africans have embraced over heights the Chinese Chatswood and Hurstville. It's Little Lebanon in Mount Lewis, Little England in Manly, a lot of Vietnam in Cabramatta, and the Maltese have made Armdell Park their own. Sydney is a mini United Nations. Now the number one surname in, in, in the Parramatta White Pages is Patel. Our smartest suburb is Birchgrove, where one in six has a degree. Our same-sex suburb is the CBD itself, where one in ten is lesbian or gay. Balmain has the highest proportion of women to men, yet Piermont, just next door, is the exact opposite. Kenhurst loves cars, almost three for every household. St Ives pays the most rent, and Potts Point reports the longest working week. Swing. And when it comes to work, the CBD is no longer this city's undisputed top dog. Sydney is undergoing an opportunity revolution, with entrepreneurial hotspots sprouting up just about everywhere. You've got the, the media and communications hubs you know, around Surrey Hills and Ultimo and high tech emerging in areas of Parramatta and even out in Penrith. It's not all just happening in the CBD alone. Darlington near Redfern has the highest percentage of unmarried bicycle riding atheists. They worship lycra more than religion, but 15 kilometres away, it's a different story, from the godless to the god-fearing. Auburn, which now has the number one religion is, is Islam, it's actually the largest uh, suburb, 33,000 people. Citywide, Christianity remains Sydney's biggest faith. But it's our multitude of religions that make this city Australia's most devout. In Horsley Park, 97% believe in a god. Kemp's Creek is 69% Catholic. Dover Heights, 48% Jewish. Grace Point is a third Anglican. Yenora, a third Hindu. And more than 50% of Lansvale is Buddhist. As for Evangelical Sydney, well, they're on the move. You've got the shift of the Bible Belt, which used to be in the, in the Hills District, uh, and now it's shifted down to the Shire. Sydney has many faces, but what binds us, the one thing we all have in common, is this often complex, always beautiful, ever-changing city. Sydney is a very diverse place, but I think in that diversity, in that difference, is a great sense of strength. We all come together as Aussies and as Sydney sides. I think that's why so many people, almost five million of us, call the city home. And demographer Mark McCrindle will be online from 7 p.m. Okay. to answer your. So, wow, do I need to say more, brothers and sisters? We live in a globalized world. And the world is right there. That's what I said in my first preaching here in 2015, my trial preaching in January or in February, when I said, the world is just right there at your doorstep, right? Now, how do we get them in? How do we get them in? We don't need to raise so much money to fly overseas, although we do pray for our missionaries out there, and they're doing a good job. Some of you will be staying with us for a year, two years, but you'll be going back to your home countries, and you will bring there the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have done our mission's part. But for us who are here in the city, how are we responding to this? And this is a picture. Acts chapter 2 is a picture of the early church. Jesus Christ went back to heaven. The Holy Spirit came down. They were filled by the Holy Spirit. Everyone heard them speak the languages that these people in the city speak. And what did Peter do? He preached the gospel, and then 3,000 got converted. What happened to the initial 3,000 people? They gathered together, right? Next slide, please. They gathered together as the first church. And what did they do? One, two, three, go. Let's read this together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and unto prayer. What are some of the five purposes of Rick Warren have you found here? What is present there? 
fellowship, obviously. What about the apostles' teaching? When you teach people, what is that? That's discipleship, right? And then, of course, breaking of the bread, which is about still fellowship and sharing the love of God. That's what they did. They didn't have massive programs. They didn't have massive strategies. They just gathered together and prayed and fellowship and ate together. And then, let's read this together. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. This talks about the empowerment of the Spirit of God. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, if we allow the Spirit of God to work in this congregation, we will move in signs and wonders and miracles. People will sense that. There is something happening in that church down the road, George Street, that decaying old building. You go inside there and you will feel the massive presence of God. That's what we want to happen. That's what we want to happen. That's why I said, keep the doors open. Let the people come in. The church is not meant to be locked. The church is not meant to be closed. Let them come in and let them feel the warmth of friendship of the people here. Let them experience the massive presence of God's Spirit here. When we sing, when we hear the message, when we fellowship with one another, that is the Spirit of God. Why are we not experiencing it? We're not giving Him space. We're not giving the Spirit of God space to move. And you're like, oh, are we going to turn charismatic now, Pastor John? No! The charismatics, the Hills District, mind the way, the Bible Belt of, uh, of Australia, I don't know, like Sydney, doesn't have the monopoly of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have the Holy Spirit of God in you? Not convinced, yeah? We don't need to make manifest in, in the ways that they do it here. There. But the, the Spirit of God is here. And, and we can see that happening in this church. What happened after that? And let's read it together. Acts chapter 2, 44 to 45. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had in need. We cannot do this anymore. It's like communism, right? We share everything. However, we can share the love of Jesus to one another. Share each other's burdens. That's why I'm looking for jobs for some of you who don't have work. Because that's the least that I can do to, your, to my brother or sister that is in need. I cannot give you support. You go to Centerlink, right? <laughs> but I can provide you a way. And everyone should care for one another. Accountability, right? That's what they did. Do you feel that way? That when you come to this church, that you can feel like, I think someone's, someone cares. That's our goal this year, Central. Are you excited that when people come here, they will just feel an overwhelming presence of God through each and every one of you? And then you know what? When I went to that church in the city, you know, it's like people are so warm. And you know what? I didn't have anything to eat. They gave me something. And they even prayed for me. And they told me that, you know what? I'm going to try to look for, ask people around and look for a job for you. That's it. That is what church is all about. I was talking to a mega church pastor in the south. And when he heard that I'm from Central Baptist Church, he said, oh, you're the one from the city. Shouldn't it that be the most happening place in the city right now? And I said, well, it will be. <laughs> it will be. Because we have the location, but we cannot hark about the location. <laughs> it's almost like real estate. Location, location, location. You may have the best location, but if the church is dead inside, people will not come here because they will smell the stink of death. But we're not dead. We have been made alive in Christ. Amen? And so let the fragrance of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ emanate from each and every one of you, brothers and sisters. Do you believe that? You can do that. You can do that. <laughs> Some of you are like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what they did. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread. Again, I told you, eating is part of it. <laughs> they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. Let's read the last line together. One, two, three, go. Enjoying. You go out there 
you go to the bar across the street, and if you ask them about us, what will they tell you? Well, I don't really know anything about that church, you know. Maybe it's a Chinese church, you know. <laughs> um, I attended uh, Ruel's dad, dad's funeral. I mean, I officiated the funeral last Friday, and we were talking to some, some people from different lands, you know, some from Egypt, some from Lebanon. And when I told them about my church in the city, they said, like, isn't that the Ch Chinese church? What are you doing there? I said, no, no, we have an international congregation. And he said, oh, yeah. and then we, we, we converse in, th in those tiny moments. I was, like, so excited, you know, like, in telling them about this church. And some of them got my number, you know, like, okay, let's, let's, let's take your number. It should be like that, you know. We should develop a reputation. But let me ask you, let's be honest about each and everyone here. If we ask the people around us, how do they see our church? But I'm, I'm not really concerned about their previous impression of the church. Let's look forward to what they're going to say. You know what? That church is the coolest church, the most caring church, the loveliest of people. They smile at you. They hug you even if they don't know you, you know, and, and they just make you feel welcome and warm. Would you like that, Central? <sighs> That's it. No strategy. <laughs> Not just be the church. That's it. They enjoyed the favor of the people. And what was the impact? Oh, it died. Can we have the last slide? Read this together. One, two, three, go. This is missions. It's people responding to the gospel that is not just proclaimed, but is lived out. This is our mission, Central. Yes, we are doing our part in sending missionaries overseas, but this is your mission here. This is your mission here, Central. If we don't do this mission, then we fail. I was talking to the Gilchrists. Do you remember the Gilchrists? They're the people that the, the, the hall in the third floor was named after. And he was telling me of how in the past, you know, they provided a space for the Chinese students' fellowship. You know, and they would need to scramble for, for room. And at the beginning, you know, because this is an Anglo church, right? And there was this you know, some of the, the comments of people are like, where are these people coming from? You know, they, they keep on like multiplying, you know, that, that kind of thing. But they gave them space. You were recipients, your parents and the generations before you were recipients of God's hospitality through this church to open up. Now it is your turn to make space, to create a space for other nationalities and other peoples, for that matter, to grow and to thrive here. It begins with your pastor, right? I'm not Chinese, but you accepted me in. And to me, that's a great privilege and honor already. But it doesn't stop me here. A lot of our foreign friends are still very much connected with me, whether you like it or not. And I don't like that. I mean, I love them all, but I don't like them connecting with me alone. Let me repeat that. I love them. They're my family. But I don't want them to be connected with me alone. What if I die? What if God takes me away? Where will these people go? To whom will they connect? And they will just find themselves coming here in and out without anyone reaching out to them. The world is here already. If we do our church like the way churches should be, people will come. And we haven't even flicked our finger, you know, like in, in doing a massive evangelism. The Lord will bring them here. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? That is what missions is. That is your mission. I'm so amazed. Every week we have people coming in. Don't worry if some of them will not stay longer. A lot of you would not want to connect with new people because they say, you know what, they're just going to be here, what, a week, six months? Two years and they're, they're gonna they're gonna disappear 
We have done our part in their discipleship. We have done our part in being there for them when they're away from home. We were migrants in Singapore. We were embraced by the Singaporean community without our parents. You know, our testimony when Tess gave birth to our first daughter. I'm sorry, Ain, I'm making you an example again. Yeah. <laughs> Dilemma of a pastor's kid, right? You know? When Tess gave birth to Ain, our parents are not there. First baby, Tess came from the corporate world. She didn't know anything about domestic chores or whatnot, you know? But she's, she did try her best, really, to adjust to a domestic life. You know what the church did? The women of the church cooked for us, provided meals for us, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, fresh meals. The ladies of the church took turns in providing us food. I ended up eating the food because it has to be fresh so that she w- because she was breastfeeding, so she would provide the nourishment for the baby. And these are Thai Thais, you know. <laughs> you know what Thai Thais are? You know, affluent Chinese uh, <laughs> women. Uh, you know, that it's like uh, the, the real housewives of Melbourne, that kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> They're like that. But they provided us. It's not the maids. They have maids. It's not the maids who cook the food. It's them. And there was one time, one lady, one, one friend came in, and she's also a Thai Thai. She's rich. She came to my house, and she was ironing my clothes, you know, because in Singapore, we work like corporate, you know, like in the pastorate. She was ironing my clothes. She has a maid. She did that, you know. And they did that for a whole month. It was like Tess and I were their children. And they made her observe the confinement period, which we don't observe in our culture. But they say, you know, ah, you, know you do this. They taught her how to, to put the diaper, to put the, you know, to bathe the baby and everything. They, it's like as if we have a family. That is what church is all about. And we were migrants, and we were embraced as if we are theirs, their family, you know. And you know, after that month, Tess and I were just praying to the Lord, and we're just crying. I said, God, we do not deserve this. But they called us our own. And even now, that's why we keep on going back to Singapore. We have our godparents who are there. They're managing everything for us. That is what church is all about. Now, I have that same affinity to those who are from other nationalities because I know the experience. That's why I own them. I, own them. I said, I'm not your brother. I'm your family. You know? And some of them are even calling me dads now. You know? <laughs> I have gained sons and daughters along the way because that is what church is all about. Let's do this, Central. Let's do this. And we can do this. This is the fifth purpose that God has given you. Worship. What's the next one? Fellowship. Discipleship. Ministry. And missions. I have nothing against cross-cultural missions, but the mission is here. So as we reflect, let us, let us all stand. And let us sing a song. This song is very significant. It's about the city. So where is your mission field, Central? Where is, where is your mission field? It's here. It's here. Look around you. George Street is teeming with people from different nationalities. If we live like the church, they will come. And this hall will be filled with people who will know God and who will love God. But the challenge of missions is yours. Let us sing the God of the city and let's make this as our prayer for this morning. You're the God of the city. You're the God of the city. You're the king of these people. You're, You're the, the Lord, Lord of this nation. He is God. You are. You're the Lord of this darkness. darkness. You're, You're the, the hope, hope to the hopeless. hopeless. You're the, the peace to the restless. You are. Sing this to God. There, there is. 
brothers and sisters and I believe we are given the challenge and we're, we're given that mandate and so even as we seek God's guidance right now oh God your people are here help us to open our eyes to the reality that we are not on our own that this is not our tiny kingdom the kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is open for everyone here in the city and so Lord help your people to open up their hearts to open up their arms wide to welcome people in and tell them about the good news of Christ in ways that are tangible, in ways that people can feel, in ways that are not lip services, Lord, but in ways that people can really experience, and that is the love of Jesus. And so, Lord, we just take this time, Lord, for, to ask for your Holy Spirit to move within us, O oh God. As the musicians continue to play, as the piano continues to play, I want you to look at me right now, okay? As always, there is a response, right, from the congregation. There's some of you who have been born here, and so therefore you're classified as Australians, right? But there are some of you who migrated here, and so even if you're Australian citizens, still you represent the country where you came from. I know it's quite daunting, okay? But I believe as the Spirit leads you, this is a... This is a response because I want the congregation to see this for themselves of where we are and what we're talking about here. So as the musicians come, for those of you who are migrants, for those of you who come from different countries, different citizenship, okay? Maybe the last person who should be coming would be an Australian citizen. But we will be asking you, okay? Don't be scared. I'm here. <laughs> um, I want you to come forward with me here and we'll give you time we have time right you come tell us your name I'm Vicente <laughs> Vicente Luis